One does not simply walk into Mordor. The land of shadow. Welcome everyone. In today's Shadowcast, we will be focusing on all things evil in the second episode, Adrift, of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. We are going to be centering in primarily on three things. The sea serpent attack, just how strange the stranger is, and of course the creepy orc fight. Uh, at the end of the sh uh, at the end of this episode, now I'm not one for emphasizing the issue of spoilers. If you haven't seen the episode two of uh, the Rings of Power, then I would not be watching a breakdown video. Um, however, there are spoilers, so I am giving you guys a warning. Before I begin, though, I just want to say how much I appreciate the gorgeous cinematic grandeur of the series so far. Uh, the showrunners have definitely captured both Tolkien and Peter Jackson's uh, vision of the larger-than-life fantasy realm of Middle-earth. Uh, looking at those beautiful vistas just makes me happy. Okay, now for the breakdown of all things evil in episode two. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. Before I begin to delve into all things evil in this episode, I want to mention a few things. First, the new opening credits which were absent from episode one. The gold and black imagery of pebbles coalescing into symbols and shapes that represent the history of Middle Earth. Not exactly what I was expecting, but beautiful nonetheless. I have a link below that explains what the meaning of this opening sequence is. Check it out. I also want to mention how much I like seeing the inner world of Khazad-dûm in all its splendor. I love the armor and faceplates of the royal guard. I'm not so happy with the way the line of Durin is being handled, which is definitely not canon, but I can understand why they're doing it this way. The relationship between Elrond and Durin IV offers some comic relief to the series that is reminiscent of the Jackson films. And I do like the way they are introducing the story of Mithril into the series and how it will likely affect the making of the Rings of Power. We also begin to see how the story of the Rings will take shape and how the desires of Celebrimbor will eventually lead to his downfall. It may not be strictly canon in story detail, but it definitely feels like it has the mythical essence of Tolkien's writing. I'm excited to see more. Now on to the monsters of Middle-earth. Let's begin with the sea serpent or fish dragon. The shipwrecked people who rescue Galadriel simply call it the worm. We see Galadriel adrift in the sea with only her knife. I have to say, this scene made me wonder if there might be sharks in Middle-earth. It turns out there are worse things under the dark waters of the sea. Galadriel comes across a shipwrecked crew clinging to the remains of the old ship when the monster arrives. Galadriel swims away, and the worm has its way with the remaining crew. It uses its tail to destroy what's left of the ship, and then eats its way through the rest. The creature is definitely a contender for addition to the brazen beasts of Middle-earth. The only survivor is Halbrand, 
who says he was driven from his lands by orcs. Their fates are now thrown together. Now, let's talk about the stranger who lands near the camp of the Harfoots. Nori Brandyfoot and her comedic friend, Poppy Proudfellow, discover the stranger in a crater of fire. Oddly, the fire does not burn, which makes me think of the fire losing its warmth in the evil fortress of the north. Hmm. The Harfoots will obviously be the heart of the show, as the hobbits are in Tolkien's story. Nori's words are full of longing and wonder. Like the dwarves, they will also offer comic relief reminiscent of the Jackson films. The two young Harfoots rescue the stranger and put him up in one of their huts. We see his strange behavior and odd powers when he awakens. He seems to have no memory, but has a driving need to find something. He scrawls words and symbols on stones, and there is a wonderful scene where he illustrates a constellation in the sky with fireflies. I have to say, it looks a bit like Sauron's symbol. Could it be? Hmm. The mystery of the stranger is still a mystery. At times, he looks lost, and at other times, quite frightening. Now on to the most interesting part of Episode 2, The Creepy Orcs of the Southlands. We pick up the story of Arondir and Bronwyn in the burning, deserted village. In one of the houses, they find a deep hole leading to a tunnel. Bronwyn returns to her village to warn her people, and Arondir heroically enters the tunnel to find out its mysteries. This part of the story is not for those who are claustrophobic. Arondir must crawl through these tight, dirt tunnels. He sees two orcs coming at him from two different directions at once. He then tries to escape. He is crawling through a very tight space, and there are rats all over him, trying to get past him, who are also fleeing for their lives. He swims through an underwater tunnel and gets out the other side, waiting for whatever is following him. Unfortunately, they come at him from behind. Then we switch to Bronwyn, who tries to warn the villagers. They don't believe her, not a word she says. Meanwhile, Theo discovers there is something creeping under the floorboards. When Bronwyn returns to the house, she discovers that it is torn apart and Theo is hiding in the wall. Then they hear something coming. She hides in a cupboard and he crawls back into the wall. This tense scene is followed by a wild action sequence as we get our first look at these tunneling orcs. As we have seen, they wear skulls as helmets, a very cool aspect to their look. The orc then reveals its horrific face. The rat-like claws, burned victim skin, and a face only a mother could love. These orcs of the Second Age seem to be the ancestors of the goblins and orcs living in the tunnels of the Misty Mountains and in the deserted passageways of the fallen Khazad-dûm. Rather than the large Uruks, who will later be bred by Sauron and Saruman in the Third Age. Though this orc has incredible strength and is wicked fast. I have to say I like the practical makeup of these orcs, but they have a creepy and hideous vibe that will take some getting used to. The sequence ends with Bronwyn taking the head of the orc to the villagers. This time they listen, and soon they are heading for the fortress in the mountainside. This leads us to the final dark reveal in this episode. 
Theo is packing up his gear when he pulls out the broken sword which he has stolen. We see blood from a wound suddenly being drawn into the sword and giving it the power to regenerate in fire and smoke. It is said that Sauron used his own blood in the making of the rings of power. Hmm. The episode ends with Galadriel and Halbrand being rescued. It looks like another chance meeting that will determine the fate of many. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of Episode 2, Adrift of the Rings of Power. Keep your eyes open for the next one, which will come soon after the premiere of Episode 3. Um, if, you, if there's anything you'd like me to change or add about how I'm doing these breakdowns, please mention it in the comments section below. So, until next time, I hope to see you in the dark shadows of the Nameless Land.